Hey, what's going on guys? It's Brian with Man's Comics. Normally at this time we would be premiering the newest Bolo show, highlighting new comic book day from first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and Jack's long-term play. But unfortunately I'm on vacation with my family at Disney World. So instead of in its place, we are gonna do a Bolo Rewind, starting with the very first Bolo episode ever from January 2019, with some clips highlighting the whole past year. So sorry, we will be back next week with the brand new Bolo show, but until then, enjoy the Bolo Rewind. What's up guys? Welcome to the live stream. It's Brian from Man's Comics. Got a pretty cool show going on tonight. So we're going to talk about the Bolo list that Jack DeMeo from Instagram does. I have Jack here co-hosting with me. We're going to try to do this every week. So this is um, the first Bolo slash dry run. We're going to take this and try to massage it to where we finally get a good product and a good weekly show. So without further ado, I want to introduce Jack DeMeo, who's from the CBSI Instagram account and the creator of The List. What's going on, everybody? Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm real happy to be here on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Um, I've been here a couple times before, and I'm excited to be doing something on a more weekly basis. Um, as he said, I am Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo, um, on Instagram. Um, I do the uh, Instagram account for CBSI with Brian. Uh, I am also a content manager and I work with CBSI behind the scenes on some of our general content plans. And um, the Bolo list was kind of a product of beginning to work on the social media and the branding of the social media. I knew that I wanted to have kind of a, uh, a cheat sheet for collectors looking to jump in, going to, going to new, on New Comic Book Day, going to their LCS and who wanted kind of like a one page easy this is what we know as of this moment right. sort of yeah. list real quick disclaimer so, this live stream is uh filmed in front of a live studio audience so yeah we make cuts and then what we put on the air is going to be different <laughs> just because we had audio issues of course the big reader buzz which everyone's well aware of right now is mad caves knights of the golden sun number four came out this week correct Correct. So, yeah, so we talked about Knights of the Golden Sun a little bit earlier with our, talking about our CBSI exclusive number one variant from comicbookinvest.com, which sold out in a quick 27 or so hours. But this week we see the release of issue number four, and the trend continues. You see an instant sellout. Um, I, I went and uh, actually made it to the LCS this week um, and was on a thing that we hear – from the community is the difficulty buying uh, this book and finding this book. And you're talking about a really low print run book that, again, people are still just raving about the art, raving about the story. And when you look on the secondary market, the book's already selling uh, just a day later, $10, $10 about $8 to $10. We're seeing $7.99 to $9.99 sales. About a month ago, I pre-ordered a 9.8 of this off of, off of Nick from Slabbed Heroes. I think he had it for like 50 60 bucks, And I'm never going to be able to afford a 9.8 in the original 181 so i definitely picked this up because so i wanted a 98 <laughs> see and i think a lot of people pick this up for various reasons similar to what you just said um i think it'll look great slabbed as well i think it'll look really cool on a wall um a lot of people picked it up to read because when are you going to get a chance to even a reader copy even a coverless copy of hulk 181 is going to cost you so if you're looking to read this book and you want to read it in kind of a comic form and feel real nostalgic, this is your opportunity. Um, also, I think they did a really good job with these facsimiles, making them really look like the real deal. Um, I would definitely watch out in the future for uh, newbie collectors yeah. not to get kind of caught up with these. But, you know, there's definitely some <laughs> some factors on the cover that give it away with like the price. And I, I'm optimistic that Marvel can do more of these type I think it gives it kind of a step up from the True Believers issues. And I think there's some other uh, books that could kind of be popular in the future. But that's something I'd love to hear in the chat. What books would you guys love to see facsimile yeah. um, reprints for? We saw a lot of that discussion on uh, the CBSI Google Plus page. Uh, I'd love to know what kind of books you guys would be looking for um, to be reprinted that you know you never would think you'd get your hands on. We are going to go right into the reader buzz section of it. So 
kicking us off for reader buzz this week, right? This is a big book. Well, me, after reading it, the book wasn't that big, but it was it was hot. Right. So hot. And that is Naomi number four. Right. So, I mean, at this point, Naomi is red hot. And a lot of this has to do with when these orders have to be in. We're, we're still. This is probably the last book that's going to come out within an order window where people were still kind of sleeping on Naomi releases. I expect five and six to be heavily ordered. Having said that, I'm still extremely bullish on those issues because we still haven't seen the official name. We still haven't seen the official costume. Um, I'm not going to spoil much in issue four, but those things did not happen. So that was being that's heavily being anticipated. People are waiting on that. People are specking on that. But this Naomi series is on fire. Obviously, Naomi was the talk of the spec community with, um, you know, some speculation blunders this week within our community um, that were very unfortunate to see, but uh, certainly had nothing to do with us. But, um, yeah, so th- that's the importance and in, in kind of the, the, the level of attention that's being paid to Naomi, where anything that's kind of coming out with Naomi is shooting up in value. It was really the first appearance of Tootie from the Facts of Life. <laughs> so, yeah, now that we got that straight. But Naomi number four, I read it. Everyone was hot about it. And to me, um, yeah, they just spent the whole time talking around a spaceship. <laughs> and, right. You know, of course, the last page kind of goes, okay, the next issue is going to have some information in it. But, right. <clears throat> so with that being said, we're going to roll into the variant buzz section for the night. At least this graphic loaded correctly. But there you go. So, um, yeah, the reader buzz. We just got the zzz part, not the buh part of the graphic. But variant buzz. This time we had the Marvel Tales Iron Man. We had the Aberrant variant. Talking Battle Lines variant. Major X number two second print. So just go roll right into the first one. Of course, Jim Bartel. If it, <laughs> yes, that's one of those ones we talk about. Every single time one of these uh, Jen Bartel variants comes out, it's here. And just like everything else, you're looking at $200 sales here. Um, but again, we, we, we've talked about this. I know I feel like I'm beating a dead horse. If you, I apologize if you've heard me say this several times, but you're looking at $8 cover price for this book. It's a 1 in 50 variant. Stores had to order 50 copies. They had to spend at least $200 to acquire one of these books. So when the book is selling for $200, People look at it like it's, well, it's selling well above ratio, but it's really not. I did a math equation to show you how to really find the ratio when a book is below the uh, the dollar per ratio. I could do that again here with this book being over. I won't bore you with the math right now. But the reality of the situation is true ratio isn't $50 for this book. It's, it's a bit higher. And... Uh, so it, it doesn't surprise me at this point that these books sell well. I, I worry about the long-term value of these books, and, and I think a lot of stores are getting stuck with the, the regular copies. I would not be surprised this summer to see um, the regular trade dress versions of these books in dollar and $2 boxes. I hope dealers aren't ordering 50 copies just trying to get the incentives because I don't think that will pay off financially. But nonetheless – Every week we see uh, one of these Marvel Tales gets released. Every couple weeks or so we see one of these Marvel Tales get released. And sure enough, they are doing well on the secondary market. Right. At least this one had actually reprinted like Tales of Suspense 39 in it, right? right. A lot of these Marvel Tales are like repenting. Rep- repenting. <laughs> yeah, they're repenting. But they're reprinting not the top tier stories for these books. But as we mentioned before, a lot of those are saving for the facsimile editions and the yep. um, True uh, Believers. Cool. An There's indie book so from IDW, and that's Canto Number One. And this is another one that we also interviewed the creators. What a week before FOC, right? We interviewed right. David Boer, Drew Zucker, the the writer and, and artist on this book, and just talking to them made me more interested in the book. And then the trailer, and then they gave us an advanced copy to read. So definitely was well aware of this book, and other people seem to like it as well. Yeah, this was one. Um... We, we, I guess say we humble bragged about, but um, I haven't been that humble about it because I was championing this book the day I, I read it in previews, the day I um, I talked to David Boer. Um, and again, I've talked about this. Part of the reason why this book sold, guys, as great as the story is, is the creators. They worked their butts off to get this in front of as many people as possible. And in independent comics, that is the game. Um, so 
you know, the, I knew with these guys, the combination of a great story, a timely story, uh, a story people could could kind of uh, connect to. I know how low printed IDW books can be. And uh, combined with these guys just being good quality guys who are out there um, really trying to promote their book, I knew that this kind of had the formula and you see it right now. Um, first prints are going for like 25 to $30 still on the market. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about the, the printing issue that went on, a lot of books get increased. I don't know whether that's a printing issue or a shipping issue. But I know, like we talked with Nick from Slab Heroes, uh, a lot of people are able to press those out. It's taken some work, but they are able to be pressed out. So um, I think that these are this is gonna be something to keep an eye on. There's a San Diego Comic-Con variant coming. There's a second print coming. They just announced that the second print is sold out and a third print is coming. Um, so yeah, these guys are killing it, man. And, and be on the lookout for issue number two. There's a, there's going to be one in 10 incentives for every single book. So be on the lookout for those. Right. I love the, I, yes, absolutely. And I love the long-term play this week because it's a pick where most people sat there and said, wait, what? So I am excited later on in the show to get into that one and explain to you why I think this is an investable book. Right. Before we get into the list, I want to welcome everyone coming into the chat. We got Nola Nerd, we got Thaddeus, and no, I'm sorry, Thaddeus, we do not have the list on MySpace, but we got Cantankerous, we got Big Dog, and we have Dead End Kids number one. Yeah, this is the book I think most indie readers were waiting on. Um, Source Point Press has been a, a, again, an indie publisher, small press publisher, on the rise. Um, you know, when we were first talking about them, a good year ago with like ogre it's been amazing how they have continued to build on each release and each release has gotten a bigger and bigger buzz and following it's tough when you're an indie publisher because you have to have kind of a history of success before speculators will kind of give you a chance but this is a book that the entire speculative market jumped on top of from the get-go first off the solicit um sounds like a tv show or a movie and i we talk about this on the channel a lot guys um you know, you got to look where speculation's going. Uh, with Marvel and DC tied up with companies being Disney and Warner Brothers, we're seeing more and more that other movie companies and streaming services are looking for IP. And they're getting that IP from comic books. And Dead Egg Kids, you know, some kids out there searching for the, you know, their the killer of their murdered friend. I mean, that just that premise right there sounds like an elevator pitch for a television show. And with the success of kind of kid-themed stories, whether it's like the new It movie or Stranger Things, we're seeing more and more of these type of books having success in the market. $20 sales on Dead End Kids already upon release. Um, absolutely incredible. It's definitely, I would say, been the hottest book Source Point Press has released to date. Um, but yeah, it's well, I haven't got a chance to read it yet. I've got copies ordered. I cannot wait to check it out. Um, let us know in the chat how you guys feel about the book. Uh, if you got a chance to read it, I know a lot of you have, are out there specking on it, or did you flip it quick before you could get that chance to read it? But uh, yeah, th this may be the winner of the week in the short term. Yes, and um, some people put in the chat that they enjoyed it. Some people put in the chat that they they weren't able to get it. Um, like like you, I have two copies on pre order, but uh, you also mentioned the sold. I noticed. Sold average twenty high. There's one au one auction out there, right? That went for forty six. Was it auction? Right. And yeah, it was an auction. Went to forty six. Listings out there, they're averaging about twenty eight dollars. And then there's one outlier sitting there at ninety nine dollars. So we'll see how that goes. But we and it's the book that we haven't talked about so far on the list tonight, and that is of course Spider Man number one. This is like the J J Abrams book. Yes, J.J. Abrams, his son, Henry Abrams, co-written. Um, it was uh, certainly met with a lot of media fervor um, when this was announced. Um, and, you know, I think it was also met with some skepticism. You know, they're just calling it Spider-Man because it's not Amazing Spider-Man and it's just this is J.J. Abrams story. All of the spec for this book surrounded uh, Cadaverous, right? Um, this new villain um, and... People feel some sort of way about the villain spec, right? So this comment in th that immediately came onto the list said, well, you know, villain spec, 
that's short lived. But Brian, didn't we talk about that last night on the Hot and Cold show? Yes. Villain spec is changing. Um, Villain spec is hot right now. People are paying attention to it. Now we're going to talk spoilers here, guys. This villain, right off the bat, kills one of the most important characters in the Marvel Universe. And we're talking Mary Jane. Right off the bat. Mary Jane, done for. Um, Now, if that doesn't get your attention, what else does a villain have to do within the first few pages of their inception, right? Um, But you know what? That's not even why I'm paying attention to this book. Um, That's not even what gets me about this book. I thought this was going to be, like most people probably, a Peter Parker story. I thought this was another, just J.J. Abrams' take on, J.J. Abrams wants to write Spider-Man, so he's writing Spider-Man. He's got that kind of clout. Or J.J. Abrams wants to write Spider-Man, um, or his kid wants to write Spider-Man, so he's using his clout to get his kid a, a, a Marvel writing job. That's the way I took it, right? And yeah, we've seen a lot of ce- celebrities write um, comics, um, my favorite is uh, CM Punk, my favorite professional wrestler of all time, writing Drax the Destroyer. It's a fun story. Um, but that's not what I think this is. First off, this to me checks all the boxes. It was a fun read. Also, full disclosure, I don't really like Spider-Man that much. I don't, I've said that before on this channel. Like, he doesn't, I don't resonate with Spider-Man. My life, I didn't grow up like Spider-Man. Um, he just, it's not my type of character. But I enjoyed reading this book. Um, it was not the book I envisioned being the long-term play of the week. Bolo Nation, Simpleman's Comics Family, what book do you think I had penciled in as my long-term play of the week? Well, of course, G.I. Joe number one. Of course. Of course that's what I was going to – full plans to come on the mic and talk G.I. Joe number one. But I had my eye on Cadaverous. Had my eye on it. Really liked that Delato 1 in 50, even though I think it might be recycled art. I'm not sure, but – you know, I'm a Del Otto guy. That's a one in 50. That's nice. I loved that uh, Perio Frankie's Comics. Yes, we're sponsored by Frankie's Comics, but this is why I think I'm proud of, like, the sponsorships that we have because, like, Nick at Slabbed Heroes does as good a work as any human being on this planet when it comes to shipping you comic books, when it comes to pressing your comic books, it comes to guaranteeing your 98s. I'm proud to represent Slabbed Heroes. Let me tell you something about Kevin Fields. He creates the most unique variants, in my opinion, on the market. That's my opinion. Um, And I'm proud to represent his brand. Um, You know, from that all purple blank uh, Joker variant that you guys, I posted on Instagram, you guys loved it, Um, to something like this, having the foresight to get cadaverous on a cover. Um, something you don't see with any of like the regular releases. We have the fact that Benji Parker takes over as Spider-Man in this issue. Peter quits after Mary Jane dies, retires as Spider-Man. Benji Parker takes over. He's given the suit. He takes over as Spider-Man. Who knew that this was going to be a completely different take on Spider-Man? And coming up on our first appearance, this is probably one of the biggest books of the week as well. That's Batman Beyond number 37. Yeah, this is a lower printed book. Um, you know, you're at a point in this run where um, most LCSs are pretty much ordering this for subscribers, maybe a few extra copies for their shelves. Um, and when you have a situation like this where you have a new character, character appears on the cover, a lot of buzz. There was also some other stuff going on, like... Um, the last of the Jokers appearing in this book, which that may be a first appearance of note. Um, you know, uh, a character, Blight, who I think, it, you know, appears in the DC universe previously, but this is kind of like that beyond version of Blight. Um, so a lot to go with this issue. Uh, there was a major buzz. A lot of damages reported on cover A, which I think has a lot to do, too, with the scarcity and rarity. And unfortunately, we had a lot of reports of LCS is kind of upcharging that cover A up to twelve to twenty dollars on release date, which then you know scares some buyers away from making those initial purchases. So all of that kind of combined into a perfect storm for this being kind of one of those books to pay attention to on uh, on New Comic Book Day. Um, also, this is a character that's kind of been teased for a few issues, so this is going to have that like cameo first full sort of debate attached to this character. 
Right. It was definitely really popular at my LCS. Plus, like you said, lower printed. They didn't have many copies, but I was there when it actually first opened today, and those were kind of the first books to go off the shelf. So people were aware of them. So confirm first appearance, and definitely some reader buzz attached to this book. Then the yeah. next one on the variant buzz is that Usagi Yo Yohimbo. This is what, the 35th anniversary issue number six? Yes, issue number six of Usagi Yohimbo. What's interesting about this one is we're talking about a 1 in 25 IDW variant. You do not see that too often at all. You and I have talked about this multiple times on the channel, right, Brian, that when you get those 1 in 25s quite often, um, they they are low printed. Now this is almost seemingly out of nowhere, um, being that there's no one in ten for this book. This is issue six, but it's the 35th anniversary of the character. This is a Jeff Darrow cover. Um, he has a kind of popular cult following. Uh, it's a cool wraparound, which is why you see kind of like the style that Brian's got displayed with the image. Um, I I don't, did not see a lot of these available. These are going right now for just over ratio. But the ratio covers are drying up. Now, remember, guys, we filmed this show on Wednesday. So everything is kind of still very, very, very fluid. We saw the Marvel Action Spider-Man triple in price from the time that we were talking about it on our show, talking about issue number 10. I'm not saying this is going to triple, but I'm just saying there's a lot of room for action. Those cheap copies are drying up, and we are starting to see the copies that are left listed go for – they're listed for like 40 bucks. I would expect to see this one be a forty or fifty dollar book easily. And the next book we're talking about is Red Mother Number One. Yeah. This is the uh, big release from Boom Studios this week. So Boom does it big again, man. Um, you know, uh, this one may not have like the secondary market penetration that some of the other books have had. This was one of my favorite reads. It, this one in is okay. So if I rank them, right, it's almost unfair. Because I love all four of these books. Yeah, and the stories are kind of different. All different, which is why I love Boom Studios. People give us, you know, they give us hell about talking about Boom or even I talk about IDW. You know, and we get those, you know, uh, like, there's no kickback. There's no, you know, there's not paid for play. Um, I just legitimately, those are my two favorite publishers. And those are my two favorite publishers for the exact reason that we're talking, the variance in story. So you look at those those hits that Boom has run out. Red Mother's my favorite. Something's Killing the Children is my second. Once in the Future is my third. And Folklords is my fourth. But having said that, I love Folklords. But Red, that's, Red Mother to me, um, when I read it, the first thing I thought was, it reminds me of an episode of Law & Order SVU, where like if you turn on an episode of Law & Order SVU, you're watching the episode. If you didn't know how the format of the show was, you think you're watching something with the characters that are going to be featured, then you realize, nope, somebody dies, and then the title card comes up, the theme music comes up, and it's like, no, now we're getting into the episode. Comic books, it's hard to be scary, right? You can do horror, but it's hard to be scary. Especially, it's not like really a jump scare when you can see the full page ahead of you. <laughs> right. Um, but that last panel, man, we talk about visualizing a movie. In a movie, I think that would be a scare the bejesus out of you panel um and it makes it makes me go who the hell is that and i can't wait to get into the next issue to really find out um that's like and, how nail biter was for me yo i mean nail biter is a series i, I you and i've talked about that before like i absolutely love nail biter um so the second print which isn't out yet but just to give you kind of some be on the lookout. The second print for Red Mother features that character on the cover from that last panel. That's one I think be on the lookout for. Um, also, boom, you know what, man? Give them credit. Like, they tried different stuff, right? So you got the thank you variant. That's something Boom's done. That's that black and white cover on the far right. You know, we've, they've got their cover B that you can see. They've got their, um, their J. Lee uh, FOC. But they also slipped in like a secret, a, ver a secret variation that was at like a one in ten ratio. Um, so dealers who ordered heavy, and again, the boom has the boom guarantee program. So what that means is stores can order heavy on issue number one because it's returnable, and any store who like took that leap and rode this one out with boom got rewarded with that one in ten 
uh, ratio. So if you're only ordering three or four, you might not have got one. But if you were ordering deep on this one, you got that extra one in ten ratio. And be on the lookout for that because stores may not be. You'd be surprised how many LCSs don't pay attention to the internet, aren't communicating through email. Um, they probably got an email from either Diamond or Boom directly, but they may not have paid attention to it. And you may find this on your shelf. I had a lot of people tell me they were finding them on the shelf today. So that's one to, to kind of be on the lookout for. 